yeah, and this rise of new tools, which require additional new learning practices, isn't it? Wasn't it the issue, Fabian? Okay, I just grab a mic. We, we don't. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Wow, it was really good this evening. And really good to listen to the different perspectives of the people contributing. But one of the things, kind of just at the end of that, with a bit about the Anti University of London, and uh, I'm familiar with uh, Jakob Jakobsen, who worked on the Free University in Copenhagen and all the problems that he got from the state wanting to shut it down. So you can't call yourself a university unless we give you permission. And then that also made me reflect on, on some of the, um, the role of things like the uh, uh, Mid-Peninsula Free University in California and the fact that when we talk about the new technology, it came out of that free university movement of the 60s. It came out of the Homebrew Computer Club. It came out of the People's uh, Computer uh, Company. That it actually is not technology led. It's led by human beings. It's led by human beings like us. It's led by human beings asserting their autonomy and not fitting in with the pre described patterns of behaviour that the corporations love. So I think in that this is more a comment than a question, but it's just kind of like picking up on, on the common theme there and sparked up particularly by that last presentation. That actually when you look at uh, what, what they call uh, learning cycles, which I, I was talking to Stefan beforehand and, and, and he mentioned them, actually it, it goes around in a circle. Right? And I think we have to understand that our approach to learning, our demands for learning, kind of push the technology. And then the technology opens up new things for us. And it kind of goes around, and it comes around, and it goes around again. So really, not really a question, but more kind of a bit of commentary, which I think relates across the board there, because I did appreciate And I, I'd like to hear people's response to that. Thank you. It's a common observation uh, to say that the, the Silicon Valley was founded by geeks and outsiders. Um, and I think what's so compelling about the moment that we're in is that the geeks won in some sense, and they hold the key now to you know, a lot of commerce and technology, not just, um, not just education and learning and knowledge. But there's a danger in that because um, you have the Peter Thiels of the world coming out to say that you don't need college and everyone can just learn in and of themselves and they're using that, there's such a fine line right between anarchism and libertarianism um, and to say we don't need a welfare state or any kind of construction um, to help empower people and, write and, and, and raise people up and I, I mean I find that a lot of the work and the ideas that I deal with walk that line um, and we romanticize the garage um, the garage mechanic, the garage inventor, and the garage rock band, um, but, but what kind of structure is going to really empower the masses? That's kind of the open, I think, open question. I'd kind of like to comment on that, because I'd argue that the, um, the beginnings of Geek were 60-ish years earlier, in a little place that's about 50 miles north of here, which, became, which was basically a secret, it was still covered by the Official Secrets Act until 1996. And an awful lot of the people in that place went on to develop the things that led to the people that Stefan and Fabian referenced and led to the growth of Silicon Valley because Churchill ordered all our versions of Colossus destroyed. For years, particularly through the 70s, we had people studying computer engineering in universities where they had tutors and lecturers and especially technicians who they find students struggling with getting a particular valve or a particular process to work, and they nudge them. They couldn't say, I know how to make that happen, because where they'd done it, where that structure had been done and made, was secret. They couldn't say, I know how to do that, I'll teach you. They had to kind of shove. 
They kept an openness in the way that computer engineering and computer science in this country were, were studied and were looked at very, very early on. Anyway, um, I, I take if you're interested in, in what the things I'm talking about and how those might apply to other things, come and have a look at the National Museum of Computing, which is based as a co-existent museum. It's a completely separate organisation, but it's based on the same site at Bletchley Park. And it's open uh, Thursdays, Saturdays and Sundays. If there's enough of you, can come and have a tour and we'll sort that out for you at another time. But you'll see a lot of these early structures, a lot of the early education things, you'll be able to have a look at the ways um, that the existing technology, the things that were discovered in academia, and came about because of the thoughts and the processes and the cryptography and all those sort of things. I mean, when Cryptonomicon referenced very obliquely Alan Turing, it wasn't completely fiction. The, the stuff that he wrote about that got salacious, yeah, that was fiction. But the other things in there, the fact that Turing spent time in the US training American mathematicians and training early computing scientists and training a lot of the people that went on to train many of the people who were involved in the Silicon Valley Revolution. It's worth, it's worth coming and looking and having a see of what we've got there. Um, I think though it's history, it's a really important way and a really good way to learn about how educational practices, non-traditional educational practices, can lead into really quite structured things. Uh, I'd like to pick up on a different aspect of uh, what you're talking about, and that's sort of universities. Um, because um, most of the people that I lecture to are desperate to have a degree from a university that is recognised by the establishment. They're really desperate for that. And it's partly to do with the fact that they haven't, you know, they'll be the first person in their family to ever have done it. And it's not, I'm completely in favour of free education and alternative establishments. Um, but I just don't think they should be called universities. I think uh, all the things that I don't like about universities are actually things that other people do like about them. And I do think they need to be there. Um, I know, you know, in the 60s, universities were places where people uh, kicked against the system and developed new things, sort of political, technological, artistic, all kinds of things. And now, universities are places where people uh, go to learn how to be mainstream. <laughs> but actually, that's what some people want. And Unless, uh, unless and until the world changes so that it's fairer for everybody, um, I think that the universities that uh, used to be polytechnics are hugely valuable in validating people and making them feel as though um, they've made progress um, and giving them a chance to uh, reach a, a lifetime benchmark that has some sort of validity uh, in society that they might not have otherwise. I mean, it's really, really important what you're talking about. You're talking about education as a social leveler mm -hmm. um, and as a medium of access, a channel of opportunity. But we have to face the fact that in the late 20th and early 21st century, um, it hasn't really worked that way. We've got social inequality on the rise and mass education is not doing anything on a, on a broad basis to actually address that. In fact, what's happening is there's degree inflation. People need BAs to work in what used to be service industry jobs. And, and here in the UK, not too long ago, you could have a middle class life without a university degree. So to defend it that way, it works for individuals, but it's not working on the societal level. It's just a, just a, a number. Um, eight, uh, sixty percent of the London workforce uh, hold a BA. 60%. So BA is actually... Well, I'm, I just wanted to respond. Yeah. I'm, I'm teaching in individuals. So each person that I teach, I'm not teaching society because I can't. And um, it's one of the most frustrating things about being um, working in higher education because you can't change things. Um, you can only work bit by bit and hope that you are educating agents for change and hope that the people that you teach will go out and change their communities. And I think for the former polytechnics, the whole idea is that that's what you do. That no matter what subject you, you teach, um, you can't go out and control their communities, but they can go out and contribute to their communities with the knowledge that you've given them. 
and it sounds very sort of blue sky thinking and a bit kind of airy fairy, but actually, um, I think it motivates quite a few people that teach at the organisation where I work. That, as I said before, it is actually politics in action, but it's micro politics. <laughs> it's really, really small, and it can feel like you know, a, you, you can feel like a speck of dust, but it feels very important to do that. Okay, maybe uh, a last to comment. To yeah, okay, cheers, thanks. Um, that I just wanted to maybe um, put all of this into context. We're talking about UK and US higher education. It's not the same in the rest of the world. There are different models. There's, there's so many free high, higher education programs in continental Europe. How many do we know? The Germans got just get rid of the student uh, fees. There you go. It's free in France as well, and uh, so on and so forth. Yeah. So no way. this is. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, but but I mean, t the global picture is rising cost and dominance by for-profit providers. That's the global picture. Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, China, and subcontinent, dominated by for-profit providers and private institutions. Um, Europe has a wonderful tradition. Of, of a welfare state and of, of paid for higher education. Australia has a really great model, but um, I would argue that the US model actually is dominant, just in terms of numbers. David. <laughs> Hello, Stefan. Um, yeah, I, the, I guess there are two things that come together in schools or universities. There's the kind of informal stuff that mammals always do, you know, play, learn, they just do it by themselves. And then there's the structure, right? you know, the institution, the building, or what have you. Uh, I've heard a lot, I came in late, so I, must, I missed some, but I've heard a lot today about uh, ethos, spirit, um, uh, what I call soft stuff, but not that much about hard structural stuff, because it seems to be that that's where the real kind of ossified problems in e education are. And yeah, there's also been some talk quite about technology and how can that disrupt that. That's fairly straightforward and obvious. Um, what I'm really interested in is what what institutional changes that are we're we're totally able to um, embody you know, in law, in code, in the way that the buildings are built. Right? Yeah, we talked about like you know there's a um, uh, um, a, a, a large movement in terms of um, in the developing world as well as in the, 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 the American world or what have you, um, of, of privatised uh, innovation in, in, in education. Uh, but there are many, many other tools that we can use in the sharing economy and so forth that I haven't really seen so far. Body. I mean, I, I heard a story, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what, what stories people have in that area. Um, I've got to confess that I've got a start-up in that area myself, <laughs> not for profit. Um, so that's a disclaimer. But um, I heard a nice story last weekend, which was that in Italy, built into, the, um, built into some law to do with education, students have the right to take over the school if they vote. Um, and they do that regularly. There's about like five or ten kind of little revolutions in Italian secondary schools. Um, and I'm wondering what similar sort of um, uh, uh, newer movements, not just historical 70s based kind of movements, there are that embody some of these kind of structures. So just a couple of case studies I can mention. Western Governors University put up the slide of it. It's a non profit, it's been around. Um, for like 15 years now, it costs $6,000 full stop, that's a full cost of, of education. Um, it's an online program, it's very tied to the workforce, but it's um, one of the top teacher preparers in the United States right now. It was ranked in the top five for math teachers in terms of the performance of those teachers in the classroom. And one of the interesting things about it is they do, um, they rely on some open source materials for their curricula. The curricula is all provided to people at their own pace. They work at their own pace and they have a 
um, mentor who's assigned to them from the beginning of their course all the way through, and that person talks to them every two weeks and helps them stay on course. That person is compensated based on the success of their students and doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, review the student's work because that would be a conflict of interest. Um, they're basically just there to motivate it, to guide, and to, um, and to reward. Uh, uh, another really interesting model in, the, um, in Rwanda is a startup called Kepler University, which uses MOOCs as the basis of a flipped classroom model with a classroom teaching, very traditional, very Socratic dialogue-based um, active learning in the classroom, and the students go home and do these lectures. And the key thing about that is that they feel that, first of all, they're, they're working their English, um, but they're, they're gaining confidence in using these university resources because they see that if they can understand the concepts that are given to them by a Stanford or MIT lecturer, then they believe that their knowledge is up to par. Um, so open content, again, is an infrastructure, and then different kinds of structures of access and scaffolding on top of that is a need recipe. Um, in terms of democratic school structure, um, most of the democratic schools um, in operation within, within the United Kingdom and within most of Europe, um, there are no democratic schools in Germany, for example. Unfortunately, um, any form of education other than very close to the outcome was out in, the, in the 40s. Um, very specific individual who I should not mention. Because my government might kill me if I think Democratic schooling in the United Kingdom dates back in the main to the 1920s. In the 1930s and 40s, A.S. Neal founded Summerhill, um, which you can find all over the internet, there's no need for this. Um, but the vast majority of those, the vast majority of schools within the United Kingdom were of that type. It was small, they were led within communities, within villages, they were often peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, the model of those schools was taken to, to the US in the, in the way that schooling happened in the United States in early, in early days. And, I mean, you can read the Laurie Ingalls Wilder books and you get a very good picture of peer-to-peer -peer education um, in, in action in those schools. So my question is, is the hat lab yeah, the continuation of I, I homeschooling would, by other means, or is it a new academy? <laughs> I would argue that it was probably both. Probably both. Lara, Martin, and then there is a question by uh, Benjamin, and then Eva. Okay, so I was, I was, I kind of flew past a lot of interesting examples. I got brought into Flo Floss Manual, sorry about that. Um, public school, publicschool.org, go and see their, their programs. They are, they are, um, they are school without a curriculum. So students bring curriculum to the school. And another one that I remember was, uh, was it University of Openness? Yeah, it was University of Openness. It was a, it was London-based artist initiative where artists would kind of and 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 everybody would come in and and start various programs. So check those two out. Uh, they can be interesting. Okay, please uh, a short response uh, from or just response uh, by by Martin. Then we have three questions, and then uh, I'm afraid we are running out of time, but. We can continue the discussion mm -hmm. um, in the bar or afterwards uh, at the pub. But still, uh, Martin and the three questions. Yeah? In UK universities over the past generation, there's been more marketization, funding models change, they're more seeing each other's competing. And this is a terrible thing. When I try to persuade academics to release the materials, under the four freedoms we've had in respect of the cartoons, they'll say, but doesn't that mean someone in a competitive university could use it? Ah, yeah. oh, but academia is supposed to be about sharing, building each other's mm -hmm. work. So that's something I would change to change the culture to enable these kind of inventions. Can I just make an announcement before? Make yeah, I forgot to announce something. We'll, we'll have on, on the 8th of November, we'll have an Aaron Schwartz uh, uh, inspired event at the Common House in Bethel Green to kind of extend this open access and scientific publishing conversation. So maybe we can put a, 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 a blog on the website, yeah? A blog yes. post on the website. Yes, yeah. Very good. Um, the microphone for Benji, the last one. Yes. 
Benjamin Green away. Hi, um, I love, a lot of the conversation tonight has uh, started and stayed within children or educated people up to, let's say, uh, early 20s. Um, I've got an interest in adult learning, um, and there was a, a, a comment in the first lecture, uh, first piece, uh, about accreditation, open accreditation, um, which chimes with the project I'm working on with Nomad Trust, and they're trying to work out their uh, tech for good funding program. And I'm wondering how do we go about identifying learning for adults uh, as it happens kind of on the job and doesn't end up buried in IP and proprietary law that you can't say such and such a person worked on this project because I wonder if anybody on the panel could comment about that and open it up to a few options, please. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, you do. Okay. Uh, check out P2P University. And check out what's the other one, Mozilla, Mozilla badges. Yeah, yeah. Oh, check that out. Badges. Yeah. Mm. If you really want to see that happen in this country, we need to throw out the Education of Adults Act 2003. Um, there are colleges that grant uh, credit based on narratives of, of knowledge. So there's a there's a really big. Um, effect that's been found that when people write about what they know and, and there's metacognition going on, they get a lot more out of their further on education. So Empire State College in New York, um, which is part of the public university system, has been doing that since the 70s. Thank you very much. Yeah. Eva? Uh, yeah, I was a question for Eva. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned in your uh, talk about the uh, accreditation and uh, what we just discussed. Uh, how do you see the, the future of that in the context of the value for money for university? Because you wrote a lot about in your book about the value for money, which is at the moment diminishing. And I'm quite charmed by Helen's naivety that working class is benefiting from spending 50 grand on nothing. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how it's panning out in uh, America because we are dealing at the moment in UK for in about 30% unemployment in graduates from very good universities with very good degrees that are getting very, very nowhere with the employment. So the reason for the meeting today is to open the discussion, what does it mean and why, why we cannot rephrase the conversation about them as consumers. If they have to pay the money, right, well, let's treat the university as a supplier and hanging around for three years and spending a lot of money may or may not lead to employment. And is that what the kids want? Uh, how is it panning out in the US? Because you had that issue for a while and now there's diminishing value on the inflation of degrees, as you mentioned. What do you think? Well, there's, there's scabs at regulation and bringing um, discipline into the market on the federal Department of Ed level. The first try was gainful employment, which was a rule um, primarily being used against for-profit institutions. Um, and this was, if you had more than one in three of your students defaulting on their loans for three years or more, like an insane amount of people suffering, um, then you could lose your accreditation. This was something that was totally defamed by the higher ed lobby. Um, and, and actually is being selectively applied even now. Uh, second, a second stab is PERS, which is the president's um, uh, performance rating system for universities. Uh, it has not yet even been announced and is already they're backing off from what they initially said, which is that they publish information about outcomes and salaries based on tuition and debt. Um, the fact is that people vote with their feet and if they can't afford um, education, they're not going to pay for it. So. Uh, you know, we have stagnated in our graduation rates. Um, high school graduation rates have risen, but people are failing at college or leaving college. Um, and uh, the, the number of families with children under 18 who actually save for college has dropped from 60% to 50% in just five years. So you have half of families with kids saying, you know what, I can't actually even try for this. And, and the ones that do save have $15,000 in the bank, so that's not gonna go very far. Um, I think that the, the value for money question is very painful because it exposes that, in our country at least, that education is an index of privilege. It's very, very closely tied to privilege. It's a reproduction of privilege. Um, and, and that's how it works. If you want to know what somebody's SAT scores are going to be, you look at their zip codes. 
Um, and so uh, it, it, it kind of makes me want to back off from education as a, even though I've made my like whole life's work around it because I think what we really need to be talking about is poverty um, if we're going to have real, real fundamental change. But learning and teaching around that is, is obviously a really, really big part of it as well. A lot of the students I teach are on bursaries, so they're not going to have a debt. <clears throat> and I'm their employability lecturer. I've got 60 students every Thursday who, if they can't get work placements, have to um, create some sort of entrepreneurial activity using the skills they've learned while they've been at the university. Um, and I think, I don't know whether the university is unusual in that, but they spend a whole year doing that. Um, quite a lot of them seem to either get jobs or start up on their own anyway. So. Um, like I said before, it's like being a speck of dust trying to sort of create change, but I think if I didn't believe that the students that I was teaching got a good deal out of what, out of what we teach them, um, I wouldn't work there. And it's an oversubscribed course, um, maybe some of them do leave with a debt, um, but as far as I can see, just empirically working with them and knowing how I feel my colleagues feel, um, we're doing our damnedest to be worth the money that they pay for us. And the last question. Um, hello. Um, I'm surprised that during this talk, um, no one actually talked about uh, hyperspace, microspace, and fab labs. You, you did a little bit, yeah. You, you put it. But what, I, what I'm saying is, um, what about these spaces that are mainly targeted to higher education and, uh, and, and are basically constrained by the dilemma of uh, being recognized generally by the, by the job market? Because usually people don't give a damn if you've been in the app space and build a gigantic, man magnetic thing because just not recognized. And not only that, but also. Um, what do you think about the integration of hyperspace into public spaces like libraries and maybe uh, generate public courses? Um, obviously, they're mainly going to be about uh, technology and, and the surroundings of it, but uh, what do you think about it? I think it's a great idea. I, I don't know how soon that can happen, but I think it's definitely a great idea. Um, uh, we were talking about hack spaces and makers culture and all in preparation to to for for this. Um, I saw. I mean, it's 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 really wonderful um, initiatives and, and they're happening everywhere. There's only one in London. More than one. More than one. Yeah. 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 There's two. <laughs> one of you. Really. really? Okay, so um, and there's some, there's, there's a okay, so there's there's four. Okay, and Ed is um, just setting up another one. Yes. And Ed is setting up another one. Five. So <laughs> well, that's great news. I wasn't aware of that. But uh, but what what was I? I was really recently. I, I noticed that there's a couple of uh, makers cafes mm -hmm. in Shoreditch, and so this really. Produced the red alert in my head, so that the the the, the um, how do you call the sh the hipster startup um, entrepreneurial types are uh, uh, pulling straight from a kind of free culture idea and practice and commodifying it, and it's outrageous. <laughs> so. I suppose more education on that level is necessary because the, the, the potential for abuse seems endless. Anyway. It's true. Actually, in America, they started to do for profit type of spaces. Yeah. And Obama yeah. went there and talked about yeah, how great it's, the spaces are. It's, it's really against, against its original idea. Maybe some uh, final comments on, on the issue of uh, the hacker spaces as the new uh, uh, academia? <coughs> or was this our final? Okay. Well, I can. I mean, thinking about thinking about standardizations and kind of all the problems of bureaucracies in higher education and all this sort of yeah. 
money and, and uh, consumerism and all that sort of stuff. Uh, theoretically, yes, but I, I, I mean, I don't know when <laughs> that's realistic at all. I mean, I'll just say one thing about that. Like, I'm a really big fan of Maker Space and Maker Fair. I spoke at World Maker Fair in New York last month. Um, Dale's a big fan of mine. I, he's dealing with corporate sponsors now and sort of taking stuff to the next level. The really big question in front of any like counterculture movement as it moves into the mainstream is like. How are you going to grow, and what are your real values, and are you satisfied? Do you want to prove your knowledge in the form of an MIT degree? Like MIT is now you can submit a maker portfolio and go to MIT and then get this degree. Are you doing it for that outside recognition, or are you doing it for the pure love of it? Is it going to stay, stay grassroots, or is it going to get big? And that's, that's punk rock, right? Like That's the problem. That's a dilemma. It's a question. But you have to sell it up to become successful. <laughs> And also, you know, don't forget, you know, we also need to think about our children. I had this discussion a couple of days ago with a guy who seriously told me that we should uh, uh, teach, uh, uh, we start to teach um, uh, children how to code in primary skills. How weird is that? I think it's totally ridiculous. You know, I think we should start. <laughs> I, think, I think we should start in kindergarten, yeah, in order to give the children a chance. Yeah, to keep up with their competitors on the job market, with the robots and with the machines. Why doesn't someone actually build um, a children's toys that will teach children the binary yeah, system? Are. Are. Why don't we use uh, digital yeah. color spaces in order to educate our children? So thank you so much for this wonderful discussion and thank you for coming and we continue the discussion outside of the